Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to another episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. And I'm Adam, your co-host. We're going to talk about an idea today that I've always wanted to implement at a company but it does take a significant amount of time and investment into building this program. What we're going to talk about is a concept called security champions and security champions, I think are can serve two different methods. Oftentimes companies will have a ring of users that they push out patches to, to kind of make sure that they don't break some companies do that, some companies don't. I think it is worth your investment in time to build a ring for users in different departments to make sure that apps don't break when you're pushing out different patches. Now, this is kind of the same concept where you're taking users from different departments, say finance or HR or customer service or whatever, and building a security program around those people to foster both a security culture as well as having people to test security tools or policies when you push them out. And I think a lot of times we feel like as defenders when we're at the company, I know I've had this burden where I feel like I'm the only person or the team is the one who's solely responsible for defense. But in reality, everyone at the company should be pitching in so this article that I read kind of walks through a way to build this program. It was written around DevSecOps, but I think if you just modify it for a security champions program in general, I think it'd be beneficial for all users. When Andy pitched this as the show tonight, I was really excited about it because in my past life, I came from IT, as did Andy. And my responsibility at the last organization I worked at before I came to Microsoft was to manage what we called at the time our super users program. And that's a program we actually brought over together, my manager and I, from a previous organization that we also worked at together. And it's exactly like Andy described, where a super users program is where you have representative users spread throughout the organization and particularly the business, because in the business is where you're going to really find those differing sets of applications and all those esoteric line of business applications. And they're the ones you really need to know that your patches, your different security policies, anything you're testing is not going to interfere with conducting business, which is why the company is in business in the first place. And it's a lot of work. So managing a super users team and keeping like our distribution list up to date and making sure everyone understands the responsibilities, that was literally one of the job responsibilities uh, that I understood when I came on board was I was going to manage that program. And it's something that you can use cross-functionally in IT. So we're going to talk about it from a cybersecurity perspective tonight, but it's something that we used for endpoint management, for patching, uh, to invite people to lunch and learns, to create awareness of IT initiatives. Just having folks who are technology, who have a technical interest or a technical background, but don't necessarily work in IT, to have them as your advocates or, or as we're calling them tonight, your champions throughout the organization. I think it's a really great idea and the article we're going to link in the show notes from dark reading that kind of prompted this podcast tonight uh, really walks through it with some great depth, but do understand that this is, this is a time investment, but it will pay off. Like this is super beneficial because imagine that every time you have a conversation like, Hey, we want to implement this security policy. And then somebody comes in and says, Oh, well, you know, blah, 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 are all the reasons we can't do it. And you say, you know what, let's put it to the test. Let's roll it out as a pilot with our super users or our security champions. 
and let's see what happens. Let's let's gather feedback. If it breaks everything, we can roll it, you know, pull it back real quick. But this is a way we can get real quick, real time feedback and understanding from the real world across all of the different disciplines of our organization. Isn't that powerful? Because how often do we sit around and talk about security initiatives in the theoretical? We say, well, this might happen, or they might push back on this, or they might do this. What if you could just test it? Like that's what we're offering here tonight. And so all of the effort you have to put in upfront and ongoing care and feeding as part of a security champions program. Yeah. It's not trivial. It's there's real work involved. However, the dividends it can pay are also great. So super excited for tonight's conversation. I think it's a good one. The first thing is that you want to create a culture of security. They talk about in the article about creating a buzz. And so when you're pitching this idea and don't get me wrong, I don't think a security team can pitch this to a company. This will have to have executive leadership buy-in from the top because you're, you're talking about across the organization. So you're going to want the executives understanding the goals that you're trying to accomplish with this program because you're going to be pulling their people. You're going to be probably giving uh, different policies that may cause downtime, may cause issues, or just certain meetings may take up time. So you're pulling people into out of their business, into yours, into this program. So executive leadership, defining your your goals for the program, whether it be deploying new security policies or just doing a a uh, a culture of security. So make sure that you outline the benefits and eliminate the pain points for it. So I think talking about the benefits is really really important here. And if you sell the benefits correctly, it should not be hard to get buy in. Because like you talked about, Andy, perhaps you deploy a policy that creates a limited set of downtime, or perhaps you do ask to have their involvement in, say, a quarterly meeting or something like that. But the benefits should so clearly outweigh any commitments you're asking for that even at the first level manager level, a first level manager should be able to see the obvious benefit of having their employee contribute to this program because they should see that, well, if we could have one person test this for everyone and prevent the whole team from ever going down, that's a win. So yeah, you know, let's, let's make this person available. Or if this person can know what's going on and be able to articulate that to the team, as opposed to getting just some email blast from security operations, that's beneficial to my team. So Think about it from the most selfish first line manager perspective and make sure that you have a pitch that addresses those concerns for like any time you're asking from their person that they see, well, this is way better and is going to benefit my team way more than anything we're asking of this one security champion. And that should be an easy sell. And in my experience, it generally is. Now you will run into some of those uh, manager types that can't see the forest for the trees. We all know they exist. We've all seen them before. And that's where you do need that executive sponsorship to push down a little bit and say, no, we're going to do this um, to address some of those folks who, again, can't see the big picture. But for the most part, I think the benefits are so easy to sell and so immediately obvious that, again, even the most selfish and self-centered and you know, tunnel-visioned first-line manager still sees the benefit. The second thing to do is to identify champions. Adam had talked about the care and feeding that you might have to do in this program. And I mean, first off, you want to identify the champions, but second off, you want to maintain that list of champions. People may move to different departments or they may leave the company and you want to make sure that that list is constantly up to date. The other thing is, you know, you generally want to find people who are enthusiastic. You don't want to get that guy who is voluntold to be a security champion. You want people who are ideally enthusiastic about the program. It gives a level of visibility um, to each business group because you want representation from all the business groups. 
Another benefit that I think is important and shouldn't be overlooked is that as you're pulling from these business groups and you're talking about security, maybe there's someone in that group that becomes interested enough that they want to cross train into security. That may be a good way to feed onto your team, you know, do some training and actually gain some interest and maybe even bolster your team from internally. We've talked about how you do want to pull from internal a lot of times because it's, it's cost effective. You already know the person, they know the environment, you know, they have knowledge of the business. And so that, that may be another way and a benefit of this program. Never thought about this as a talent pipeline, but that is a clever call out. I like that a lot because we've talked about that in past shows of needing to spread out, um, our, our, where we're looking for talent for our security teams and what better way than, than looking throughout the business and seeing who might have an interest or might have the skills needed to come on board and, you know, bring that diverse perspective or that perspective of the business to the team. And again, they already kind of understand the culture. They're a cultural fit. We, we know their kind of work ethic and background. Like there's a lot that we've already validated. So that's a really good call out. I think, um, Andy, you may have said this uh, in the pre-show, you were talking about that the larger and more complex your organization is, the harder it might be to do that initial identification of champions. Because if you have, you know, so many business units, you can't even keep track of them all. It might be a quite a process just to, you know, drill down the org chart essentially into all the different business units and get, you know, individual contributors across all of them to assist you. Um, at smaller organizations or mid-sized orgs, this might be a little easier because you're only going to have, you know, so many different job roles and job functions that you really need to account for. So, um, you, you know, adjust it, tailor it to your organization and the size of it, because if you have a lot of these different business units, but ultimately the kind of job functions are the same, like, you know, an accountant is an accountant, regardless of which operating company they work for in your conglomerate then maybe you don't need to account for every single different accounting team. You just need an accountant kind of thing, you know? So feel free to mix and match this to what's right to your org size. But again, you know, I think a point we'll make a couple of times on here, a lot of work, a lot of payoff. I think you, just like with any other security tool or program that you're trying to roll out, I always focus on the high risk departments and users. So if if your if your company is so big that you can't really feasibly have a representative from every single department, then just start with the high risk ones. Obviously IT, you know, you're going to have someone from within IT, um, maybe a couple different departments of IT, but also legal, HR, finance, and those folks in those Departments already know that the the information that they have access to is valuable. And so they already have a security or privacy minded folks that work in those departments. So I think it would be an easy pitch to get people there. Another one are executives. I think having a security champion on the executive team, maybe it is one of the admins um, because, you know, those VPs and, and EVPs are always wanting to, do shady things like access different things on their personal devices or exclude them from MFA, stuff like that. Right. And you want someone who can, who's close to them, who has their trust because, you know, sometimes security folks were a little bit farther away from the chain of command. But if you have an admin there, those people know the ins and outs of the, you know, the VPs and and presidents and CEOs that they're uh, reporting to um, they're trusted. And so, having them explain the security benefits or kind of, you know, push back may be a better way to go about it than rather have someone from security go in there and tell them, Hey, this is what you need to do. So uh, start small, focus on the, the key uh, organizations that are high risk. And, you know, that's that, that I think is, is um, a good starting place. Love the call out for the executive admins. They're the ones who really run the company, as I always say. 
And they're definitely ones you want to be on their good side. I learned that lesson the hard way until I really befriended all of them and then became really close with all the executive admins. And so certainly they have their fingers on the pulse of a lot of things and are definitely somebody you want on your team uh, as you're building this, this champions model. And I like the call out too, because something we talk about a lot on the show is if you wait until everything is perfect, you're never going to get anything done. And so if you're like, well, we're not starting the security champions program until we've identified a security champion in every single, you know, group of individual contributors in our company, like, well, great. You've got a year project to identify them and it's going to be a year before you do anything valuable. Maybe not the best you know, way to go about it. Get what I like to refer to as a minimum viable product. Get to enough people, like Andy said, perhaps high risk. And say, once we've got enough security champions to start kind of building our program, we'll move on to next steps from the identification process and the rollout process. And I think that's a really, really great idea. Do not wait until you've got everybody in the pool before you start the pool party kind of thing, you know, and um, just two really great call outs there, Andy, that I totally agree with. The sooner you get the program going, the sooner you can get that feedback and start to adapt and make it even better and easier to onboard the next person and the next person and so on. I kind of did this at my previous company, not in the sense that we had different departments, but I had a meeting set up weekly with the folks from our support desk. And the way that the previous company that I worked at um, functioned was they had support staff assigned to each different department. So in a sense, if I was meeting with them and telling them what was coming out, they knew the ins and outs of different programs of how they worked. And a lot of times their machines were configured just like the users that they were supporting. And so um, it was important in the fact that when we had this meeting, we could tell them, Hey, you know, this is stuff that we're pushing out this week. These are policies that we're playing with. Um, And a lot of times they were willing to test the policies for us. Uh, But it wasn't exactly the super users in each department. It was the support staff, which obviously are very technically minded folks. Um, But I mean, that was something it was, it was a meeting that was set up and it was folks who, who are, you know, trying to help you deploy the products that you're, that you're trying to deploy. As you're thinking about expanding the program outside of your initial identified security champions. And again, like Adam said, it could just be a few, maybe, maybe it's just starting with it. Um, You want to make sure that the program is successful. Like we talked about those goals in the beginning and your, um, what you're trying to accomplish with the program, make sure that you feel like it's successful, that the champions are active. The things that you're talking about are being implemented or they're talking about it. And if it is, then, you know, start expanding outside of your original number of champions. One of the things that, you know, Adam, I talked about in the pre-show is, you know, the, the security champions could be another set of eyes for you in those departments. Like if Jane from finance gets a phishing email because there's a champion within that finance department, they could go to that champion and be like, Hey, what do you think about this? And if you're doing your job and training these security champions, recognizing, okay, the sender doesn't match the, um, the email address or the domain looks funky or the link doesn't match the, words that it's being linked to stuff like that, you know, or the language doesn't, doesn't match, then it's just another set of eyes for you. That'll help stop the next attack. Right. Well, not just stop the next attack, but kind of democratize security in general, in terms of bringing it to everyone and, and having those, friendlier conversations about it because it's way easier to go ask my peer and say, Hey, can you, can you take a look at this email? It looks funny to me. And if they can kind of come over to your screen and be like, Oh yeah, yeah. See, I, um, this looks weird and this looks sketchy. Yeah. I would, I would report this to it. Like that's much more accessible 
than just like, eh, I don't want to call the help desk and wait on hold and, you know, kind of get lectured about this or anything or, or kind of talked at because sometimes us technologists, we have a bad habit of talking at people instead of talking with people. And so that just feels like a way more accessible way to teach people in a, in a lower impact setting, like how to think about it, what to look for, what are the warning signs? And that scenario you just described right there between two folks in accounting, having a security conversation, isn't that like our dream come true as security professionals that folks in the rest of the business, we have now created a culture of security so that two non cybersecurity professionals can still have that conversation and look for those warning signs. That's a dream come true. That's the whole point of the program right there let alone being able to test new policies or being able to test patches or anything else. Like that's all wonderful to have. And, and honestly stuff you need to have anymore, but really the goal is if we can bring security to everyone and make security conversations, part of everyday life and everyday thought, that's when our organization gets really strong security posture. So I think that that's awesome to think about. I hope that would happen. Yeah, when I read through this article, I immediately thought of the patching situation at most companies, right? Because you want to have those deployment rings, essentially, where not a lot of people do that these days. I think there's a, you know, not to get off on the tangent here, but uh, a lot of people are afraid of these patches when 90% of the time nothing ever happens, right? So they... um but it reminded me of how you could have groups of people be, you know, the, the testers that you can roll out to. I've always had that at a company. This is more formalizing it. Um, I've had people who I know won't push back or know me enough that, you know, if something goes wrong that I'll take care of them and I can go to them and say, hey, can you can you test this for me? But this is a more formalized program, and I think if you take the time to invest in something like this, it'll pay dividends. And, and patching, you know, is is one workload, but it encapsulates this idea better than just about anything, right? In, in terms of so something we articulate at Microsoft a lot nowadays is that we would love to see you move your patching to something called. Windows update, Microsoft update for business, Windows update for business. And the idea behind it is really that IT admins basically have their hands in patching way too much and spend way too much time wringing their hands on it and micromanaging it and doing this and that. And really patching should be pretty much automated. Patching should be something that happens automatically that nobody has to approve or think about and patching only has human interaction when something goes wrong. And that's the whole idea here is that if you create those deployment rings, so you think of concentric circles where each circle grows bigger, each ring grows bigger over time. You start with like your alpha ring, which is like your super geeky folks inside of it who are really bleeding edge. They get patches, you know, let's say day and date on patch Tuesday. And then, you know, three days later, the rest of IT gets it uh, over the weekend, right? And that's kind of your beta ring. And then your next one is your security champions. You know, your folks throughout the organization, throughout the business, who can be kind of your canaries in the coal mine to let you know if, any, if these patches broke anything. And they get it, let's say, a week after Patch Tuesday. And you give it a week. And if you don't hear anybody scream... Then the following Tuesday, so now we're two Tuesdays out or whatever, um, now you deploy it to the whole organization. There's no hands-on involvement with that. That's all automated. That's all built in. And the only thing that happens is if something breaks, that's when you hit the big red stop button and you get involved with it. And that's what this delivers. And, and it's honestly something a lot of organizations don't have. They have those deployment circles for IT. You know, they can identify the, the bleeding edge folks in IT and then the rest of IT, but they don't have that third ring that I just described. That's this program 
where we can get it out to these kind of bleeding edge folks in the business and find out what happens and think what I just described and how powerful that is and how much time you have somebody in your company, you know, spend on patching and thinking about patching and worrying about patching when 99% of the time patches are benign, you know, nothing bad happens and you go on with life and we spend an inordinate amount of time wringing our hands over patches when they rarely break stuff. And instead we should just have a model that we don't care about it until something breaks. And that's when we get involved. That's the right way to do it. So I think that model really helps articulate, you know, what we're trying to do here. We're creating that third deployment ring between general population and in internal IT. I hope this conversation gave you something to think about and maybe you'll uh, start a security champions program at your company. Just make sure that somebody owns it because it will take some care and feeding to maintain it. So um, if no one is assigned to own it, I am sure it's just going to wither away into nothingness. So that's our show for this week. Thanks as always for listening. Our contact information will be in the show notes. If you have any questions or topics you want us to talk about, we'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJAW0 and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.